Book Two, Part One of the Iliad of Homer, rendered into English blank verse by Edward, Earl of Derby. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Michael Armenta. Argument. The trial of the army and catalogue of the forces. Jupiter, in pursuance of the request of Thetis, sends a deceitful vision to Agamemnon, persuading him to lead the army to battle, in order to make the Greeks sensible of their want of Achilles. The general, who is deluded with the hopes of taking Troy without his assistance, but fears the army was discouraged by his absence and the late plague, as well as by length of time, contrives to make trial of their disposition by a stratagem. He first communicates his design to the princes in council, that he would propose a return to the soldiers, and that they should put a stop to them if the proposal was embraced. Then he assembles the whole host, and upon moving for a return to Greece, they unanimously agree to it, and run to prepare the ships. They are detained by the management of Ulysses, who chastises the insolence of Thersites. The assembly is recalled, several speeches made on the occasion, and at length the advice of Nestor followed, which was to make a general muster of the troops, and to divide them into their several nations before they proceeded to battle. This gives occasion to the poet to enumerate all the forces of the Greeks and Trojans in a large catalogue. The time employed in this book consists not entirely of one day. The scene lies in the Grecian camp and upon the seashore. Toward the end it removes to Troy. All night in sleep reposed the other gods and helmet warriors, but the eyes of Jove sweet slumber held not, pondering in his mind how to avenge Achilles' cause, and pour destructive slaughter on the Grecian host. Thus, as he mused, the wisest course appeared, by a deluding vision to mislead the son of Atreus, and with winged words thus to a phantom form he gave command, Hie thee, deluding vision, to the camp and ships of Greece, to Agamemnon's tent. There, changing not as I command thee, speak. Bid that he arm in haste the long-haired Greeks to combat. For the wide-built streets of Troy he now may capture, since the immortal gods watch over her no longer. All are gained by Juno's prayers, and woes impend o'er Troy. He said, the vision heard, and straight obeyed. Swiftly he sped, and reached the Grecian ships, and sought the son of Atreus. Him he found within his tent, wrapped in ambrosial sleep. Above his head he stood, like Neleus' son, Nestor, whom Agamemnon reverenced most of all the elders. In his likeness clothed, thus spoke the heavenly vision. Sleep'st thou, son of Atreus, valiant warrior, horseman bold? To sleep all night, but ill becomes a chief, Charged with the public weal and cares of state. Hear now the words I bear. To thee I come, a messenger from Jove, Who from on high looks down on thee With eyes of pitying love. He bids thee arm in haste the long-haired greeks to combat since the wide-built streets of troy thou now mayst capture for the immortal gods watch o'er her no longer 
all are gained by Juno's prayers, and woes impend o'er Troy. Bear this in mind, and when from sleep aroused, let not my words from thy remembrance fade. This said, he vanished, and the monarch left, inspired with thoughts which ne'er should come to pass. For in that day he vainly hoped to take the town of Priam, ignorant what Jove designed in secret, or what woes, what groans, what lengthened labours in the stubborn fight were yet for Trojans and for Greeks in store. He woke from sleep, but o'er his senses spread dwelt still the heavenly voice. He sat upright, he donned his vest of texture fine, new wrought. Then o'er it threw his ample robe, and bound his sandals fair around his well-turned feet, and o'er his shoulders flung his sword adorned with silver studs, and bearing in his hand his royal staff ancestral to the ships where lay the brass-clad warriors, bent his way. Aurora now was rising up the steep of great Olympus, to the immortal gods pure light diffusing, when Atrides bade the clear-voiced heralds to the assembly call the general host. They gave the word, and straight from every quarter thronged the eager crowd. But first of all the elders, by the side of Nestor's ship, the aged Pylian chief, a secret conclave, Agamemnon called, and prudent, thus the chosen few addressed. Hear me, my friends. In the still hours of night, I saw a heavenly vision in my sleep, most like it seemed in stature, form, and face to reverend Nestor. At my head it stood, and with these words addressed me. Sleep'st thou, son of Atreus, valiant warrior, horseman bold? To sleep all night but ill becomes a chief, charged with the public weal and cares of state. Hear now the words I bear. To thee I come, a messenger from Jove, who from on high looks down on thee with eyes of pitying love. He bids thee arm in haste the long-haired Greeks to combat, since the wide-built streets of Troy thou now mayst capture, for the immortal gods watch o'er her no longer. All are gained by Juno's prayers, and woes impend o'er Troy. Bear thou my words in mind. Thus, as he spoke, he vanished, and sweet sleep forsook mine eyes. Seek we then straight to arm the sons of Greece. But first, as is our wont, myself will prove the spirit of the army, and suggest their homeward voyage. Ye, throughout the camp, restore their courage, and restrain from flight. Thus, having said, he sat. And next arose Nestor, the chief of Pylos' sandy shore, who thus with prudent speech replied and said, O friends, the chiefs and counsellors of Greece, if any other had this vision seen, we should have deemed it false, and laughed to scorn the idle tale. But now it hath appeared of all our army to the foremost man. Seek we then straight to arm the sons of Greece. He said, and from the council led the way. Up rose the sceptred monarchs, and obeyed their leader's call. 
and round them thronged the crowd. As swarms of bees that pour in ceaseless stream from out the crevice of some hollow rock, now clustering, and anon mid vernal flowers, some here, some there, in busy numbers fly, so to the assembly from their tents and ships the countless tribes came thronging. In their midst, by Jove enkindled, rumour urged them on. Great was the din, and as the mighty mass sat down, the solid earth beneath them groaned. Nine heralds raised their voices loud to quell the storm of tongues, and bade the noisy crowd be still, and listen to the heaven-born kings. At length they all were seated, and a while their clamours sank to silence. Then up rose the monarch Agamemnon, in his hand his royal staff, the work of Vulcan's art, which Vulcan to the son of Saturn gave, to Hermes he, the heavenly messenger, Hermes to Pelops, matchless charioteer, Pelops to Atreus, Atreus at his death bequeathed it to Thyestes, wealthy lord of numerous herds, to Agamemnon, last Thyestes left it, token of his sway o'er all the Argive coast, and neighbouring isles. On this the monarch lent, thus as he spoke. Friends, Grecian heroes, ministers of Mars, grievous and all unlooked for is the blow which Jove hath dealt me. By his promise led, I hoped to raise the strong-built walls of Troy, and home return in safety. But it seems he falsifies his word, and bids me now return to Argos. Frustrate of my hope, dishonoured, and with grievous loss of men. Such now appears the o'erruling sovereign will of Saturn's son who oft hath sunk the heads of many a lofty city in the dust, and yet will sink, for mighty is his hand. Tis shame, indeed, that future days should hear how such a force as ours, so great, so brave, hath thus been baffled, fighting, as we do, gainst numbers far inferior to our own, and see no end of all our warlike toil? Or should we choose, on terms of plighted truce, Trojans and Greeks, to number our array? Of Trojans, all that dwell within the town, and we, by tens disposed, to every ten to crown our cups, one Trojan should assign, Full many a ten no cup-bearer would find. So far the sons of Greece outnumber all that dwell within the town, but to their aid bold warriors come from all the cities round, who greatly harass me, and render vain my hope to storm the strong-built walls of Troy. Already now nine weary years have passed. The timbers of our ships are all decayed, the cordage rotted. In our homes the while our wives and helpless children sit, in vain expecting our return. And still the work for which we hither came remains undone. Hear then my counsel. Let us all agree, home, to direct our course, since here in vain we strive to take the well-built walls of Troy. Thus, as he spoke, 
the crowd that had not heard the secret counsel by his words was moved so swayed and heaved the multitude as when o'er the vast billows of the Icarian sea eurus and notus from the clouds of heaven pour forth their fury or as some deep field of wavy corn when sweeping o'er the plain the ruffling west wind sways the bending ears so was the assembly stirred and toward the ships with clamorous joy they rushed beneath their feet rose clouds of dust while one to other called to seize the ships and drag them to the main they cleared the channels and with shouts of home that rose to heaven they knocked the shores away then had the greeks in shameful flight withdrawn had juno not to pallas thus appealed o oh, heaven brave child of aegis-bearing jove shall thus the greeks in ignominious flight o'er the wide sea their homeward course pursue and as a trophy to the sons of troy the argive helen leave on whose account far from their home so many valiant greeks have cast their lives away go quickly thou amid the brass-clad greeks and man by man address with words persuasive nor permit to launch their well-trimmed vessels on the deep she said nor did minerva not obey but swift descending from olympus heights with rapid flight she reached the grecian ships laertes son in council sage as jove there found she standing he no hand had laid on his dark vessel for with bitter grief his heart was filled the blue-eyed maid approached and thus addressed him great laertes son ulysses sage in council can it be that you the men of greece embarking thus on your swift ships in ignominious flight o'er the wide sea will take your homeward way and as a trophy to the sons of troy the argive helen leave on whose account far from their homes so many valiant greeks have cast their lives away go quickly thou among the multitude and man by man address with words persuasive nor permit to launch their well-trimmed vessels on the deep she said the heavenly voice ulysses knew straight springing to the course he cast aside and to eurybates of ithaca his herald and attendant threw his robe then to atrides hastened and by him armed with his royal staff ancestral passed with rapid step amid the ships of greece each king or leader whom he found he thus with cheering words encouraged and restrained o oh, gallant friend tis not for thee to yield like meaner men to panic but thyself sit quiet and the common herd restrain thou knowest not yet atrides secret mind he tries us now and may reprove us soon his words in council reached not all our ears see that he work us not some ill for fierce his anger and the lord of council jove from whom proceeds all honour loves him well but of the common herd whom e'er he found clamouring he checked with staff and threatening words good friend keep still 
and hear what others say, thy betters far, for thou art good for naught, of small account in council or in fight. All are not sovereigns here, ill fares the state where many masters rule. Let one be lord, one king supreme, to whom wise Saturn's son, in token of his sovereign power, hath given the sceptre's sway and ministry of law. Such were his words, as through the ranks he passed. They from the vessels and the tents again thronged to the assembly, with such rush of sound as when the many dashing ocean's wave breaks on the shore and foams the frothing sea. The others all were settled in their seats. Only Thersites, with unmeasured words, of which he had good store, to rate the chiefs, not overseemly, but wherewith he thought to move the crowd to laughter, brawled aloud. The ugliest man was he who came to Troy, with squinting eyes and one distorted foot, his shoulders round, and buried in his breast his narrow head, with scanty growth of hair. Against Achilles and Ulysses most his hate was turned, on them his venom poured. Anon at Agamemnon's self he launched his loud-tongued ribaldry. Against him he knew incensed the public mind, and, bawling loud with skewel words, he thus addressed the king. What more, thou son of Atreus, wouldst thou have? Thy tents are full of brass, and in those tents many fair women, whom, from all the spoil, we Greeks, whene'er some wealthy town we take, choose first of all, and set apart for thee. Or dost thou thirst for gold, hmm? which here perchance some Trojan brings, the ransom of his son, captured by me or by some other Greek, or some new girl to satisfy thy lust, kept for thyself apart? A leader, thou shouldst not do evil lead the sons of Greece, ye slaves, ye coward souls, women of Greece. I will not call you men. Why go we not home with our ships, and leave this mighty chief to gloat upon his treasures, and find out whether in truth he needs our aid or no? Who on Achilles is superior far, foul scorn hath cast, and robbed him of his prize? which for himself he keeps. Achilles, sure, is not intemperate, but mild of mood. Else, Atreus' son, this insult were thy last. On Agamemnon, leader of the host, with words like these, Thersites poured his hate. But straight Ulysses at his side appeared, and spoke with scornful glance in stern rebuke. Thou babbling fool, Thersites, prompt of speech, restrain thy tongue, nor singly thus presume the kings to slander, thou the meanest far of all that with the Atridae came to Troy. Ill it beseems that such an one as thou should lift thy voice against the kings, and rail with scurril ribaldry and prates of home. 
how these affairs may end we know not yet nor how or well or ill we may return cease then against atrides king of men to pour thy spite for that the valiant greeks to him despite thy railing as of right an ample portion of the spoils assign but this i tell thee and will make it good if e'er i find thee play the fool as now then may these shoulders cease this head to bear and may my son telemachus no more own me his father if i strip not off thy mantle and thy garments i expose thy nakedness and flog thee to the ships howling and scourged with ignominious stripes thus as he spoke upon thersites neck and back came down his heavy staff the wretch shrank from the blow and scalding tears let fall where struck the golden studded staff appeared a bloody wheel thersites quailed and down quivering with pain he sat and wiped away with horrible grimace the trickling tears the greeks despite their anger laughed aloud and one to other said good faith of all the many works ulysses well hath done wise in the council foremost in the fight he ne'er hath done a better than when now he makes this scurril babbler hold his peace methinks his headstrong spirit will not soon lead him again to vilify the kings thus spoke the general voice but staff in hand ulysses rose minerva by his side in likeness of a herald bade the crowd keep silence that the greeks from first to last might hear his words and ponder his advice he thus with prudent phrase his speech began great son of atreus on thy name o king throughout the world will foul reproach be cast if greeks forget their promise nor make good the vow they took to thee when hitherward we sailed from argos grassy plains to raise ere our return the well-built walls of troy but now like helpless widows or like babes they mourn their cruel fate and pine for home tis hard indeed defeated to return the seaman murmurs if from wife and home even for one month his well-found bark be stayed tossed by the wintry blasts and stormy sea but us the ninth revolving year beholds still lingering here i cannot therefore blame our valiant greeks if by the ships i hear their murmurs yet twere surely worst of all long to remain and bootless to return bear up my friends remain a while and see if calchas truly prophesy or no for this ye all have seen and can yourselves bear witness all who were yet spared by fate not long ago when ships of greece were met at aulis charged with evil freight for troy and we around a fountain to the gods our altars reared with faultless hecatombs near a fair plane tree where bright water flowed behold a wonder by olympian jove sent forth to light a snake 
with burnished scales of aspect fearful issuing from beneath the altars glided to the plane tree straight there on the topmost bough beneath the leaves cowering a sparrow's callow nestlings lay eight fledglings and the parent's bird the ninth all the eight nestlings uttering piercing cries the snake devoured and as the mother flew lamenting o'er her offspring round and round uncoiling caught her shrieking by the wing then when the sparrow's nestlings and herself the snake had swallowed by the god who first sent him to light a miracle was wrought for jove the deep designing saturn's son turned him to stone he stood and wondering gazed but when this prodigy befell our rites calchas inspired of heaven took up his speech ye long-haired sons of greece why stand ye thus in mute amaze to us olympian jove to whom be endless praise vouchsafes this sign late sent of late fulfilment as ye saw the snake devour the sparrow and her young eight nestlings and the parent bird the ninth so for so many years are we condemned to wage a fruitless war but in the tenth the wide-built city shall at last be ours thus he foretold and now the time is come here then ye well-grieved greeks let all remain till priam's wealthy city be our own he said and loudly cheered the greeks and loud from all the hollow ships came back the cheers in admiration of ulysses speech gerenian nestor next took up the word like children grecian warriors ye debate like babes to whom unknown are feats of arms where then are now our solemn covenants our plighted oaths go cast we to the fire our councils held our warriors plans matured our absolute pledges and our hand plight given in which our trust was placed since thus in vain in words we wrangle and how long soe'er we here remain solution none we find atrides thou as is thy wont maintain unchanged thy counsel for the stubborn fight array the greeks and let perdition seize those few those two or three among the host who hold their separate counsel not on them depends the issue rather than return to argos ere we prove if jove indeed will falsify his promise word or no or well i ween that on the day when first we grecians hitherward our course addressed to troy the messengers of blood and death the o'er-ruling saturn on our right his lightning flashing with auspicious sign assured us of his favour let not then the thoughts of home be breathed ere trojan wives given to our warriors retribution pay for wrongs by us in helen's cause sustained but who so longs if such an one there be to make his homeward voyage let him take his well-rigged bark and go before the rest to meet the doom of death but thou 
O king, be well advised thyself, and others lead by wholesome counsel. For the words I speak are not to be despised. By tribes and clans, O Agamemnon, range thy troops, that so tribe may to tribe give aid, and clan to clan. If thus thou do, and Greeks thy words obey, then shalt thou see of chiefs and troops alike the good and bad. For on their own behoof they all shall fight. And if thou fail, shalt know whether thy failure be of heaven's decree, or man's default and ignorance of war. To whom the monarch Agamemnon thus. Father, in counsel of the sons of Greece, none can compare with thee, and would to Jove, to Pallas, and Apollo, at my side I had but ten such counsellors as thee. Then soon should royal Priam's city fall, taken and destroyed by our victorious hands. But now on me hath Aegis bearing Jove, the son of Saturn, fruitless toil imposed, and hurtful quarrels, for in wordy war about a girl, Achilles and myself engaged, and I, alas, the strife began. Could we be friends again, delay were none. How short soe'er of Ilium's final doom! But now, to breakfast ere we wage the fight, Each sharpen well his spear, his shield prepare, And to his fiery steeds their forage give, Each look his chariot o'er, That through the day we may unwearied Stem the tide of war. For respite none, how short soe'er shall be, Till night shall bid the storm of battle cease. With sweat shall reek upon each warrior's breast The leathern belt beneath the covering shield, And hands shall ache that wield the ponderous spear. With sweat shall reek the fiery steeds that draw each warrior's car. But whomsoe'er I find loitering beside the beaked ships, for him twere hard to scape the vultures and the dogs. He said, and from the applauding ranks of Greece rose a loud sound. As when the ocean wave, driven by the south wind on some lofty beach, Dashes against a prominent crag, exposed to blasts from every storm that roars around. Uprising then, and through the camp dispersed, they took their several ways, And by their tents the fires they lighted, and the meal prepared and each to some one of the immortal gods his offering made, that in the coming fight he might escape the bitter doom of death. But to the o'erruling son of Saturn, Jove, a sturdy ox, well-fattened, five years old, Atrides slew, and to the banquet called the aged chiefs and counsellors of Greece. Nestor the first, the king Idomeneus, the two Aegises next, and Tydeus' son, Ulysses sixth, as Jove in council sage. But uninvited Menelaus came, knowing what cares upon his brother pressed. Around the ox they stood, and on his head the salt cake sprinkled. Then amid them all 
the monarch Agamemnon prayed aloud, Most great, most glorious Jove, who dwellst on high in clouds and darkness veiled, grant thou that ere the sun shall set and night o'erspread the earth, I may the haughty walls of Priam's house lay prostrate in the dust, and burn with fire his lofty gates, and strip from Hector's breast his sword-rent tunic, while around his corpse many brave comrades prostrate bite the dust. Thus he, but Saturn's son his prayer denied, received his offerings, but his toils increased. Their prayers concluded, and the salt cake strewed upon the victim's head. They drew him back, and slew, and flayed, then cutting from the thighs the choicest pieces, and in double layers, or spreading them with fat, above them placed the due meat offerings. These they burnt with logs of leafless timber, and the inward parts, first to be tasted, o'er the fire they held. The thighs consumed with fire, the inward parts they tasted first, the rest upon the spits roasted with care, and from the fire withdrew. Their labors ended, and the feast prepared, they shared the social meal nor lacked their aught. The rage of thirst and hunger satisfied, Tyrrhenian Nestor thus his speech began. Most mighty Agamemnon, king of men, great Atreus' son, no longer let us pause the work delaying which the powers of heaven have trusted to our hands. Do thou forthwith bid that the heralds proclamation make, and summon through the camp the brass-clad Greeks, while in a body through the widespread ranks we pass, and stimulate their warlike zeal. He said, and Agamemnon, king of men, obedient to his counsel, gave command that to the war the clear-voiced heralds call the long-haired Greeks. They gave the word, and straight from every quarter thronged the eager crowd. The heaven-born kings, encircling Atreus' son, the troops inspected. Pallas, blue-eyed maid, before the chiefs her glorious aegis bore, by time untouched, immortal. All around a hundred tassels hung, rare works of art, all gold, and each one a hundred oxen's price. With this the goddess passed along the ranks, exciting all, and fixed in every breast the firm resolve to wage unwearied war, and dearer to their hearts than thoughts of home or wished return became the battlefield. As when a wasting fire on mountain tops hath seized the blazing woods, afar is seen the glaring light, so as they moved to heaven flashed the bright glitter of their burnished arms. As when a numerous flock of birds, or geese, or cranes, or long-necked swans, on Asian mead beside Caster's stream, now here, now there, disporting, ply their wings, then settle down with clamorous noise that all the mead resounds, so to Scamander's plain, from tents and ships, poured forth the countless tribes. The firm earth groaned beneath the tramp of steeds and armed men. 
upon scamander's flowery mead they stood unnumbered as the vernal leaves and flowers or as the multitudinous swarms of flies that round the cattle sheds in spring tide pour while the warm milk is frothing in the pail so numberless upon the plain arrayed for troy's destruction stood the long-haired greeks and as experienced goat-herds when their flocks are mingled in the pasture portion out their several charges so the chiefs arrayed their squadrons for the fight while in the midst the mighty monarch agamemnon moved his eye and lofty brow the counterpart of jove the lord of thunder in his girth another mars with neptune's ample chest as mid the thronging heifers in a herd stands proudly eminent the lordly bull so by jove's will stood eminent that day mid many heroes atreus god-like son end of book two part one